The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. Walt Mossberg, is technology plateaued? Oh no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Technology is uh, uh, always changing and always coming up with technology companies are always coming up with something new and there are new technology companies all the time incubating. Uh, there a lot of them are in what we call stealth mode. We don't even know who they are. Now certain technologies plateau and things move on, but uh, in general, no, not at all. I guess I ask that because in the last couple of years we've had the explosion of smartphones. We've had tablets come online. What's out there? Well, first of all, there are vast numbers of people, in, especially in, in the less developed countries, but even in the developed countries, who don't own uh, a smartphone. And uh, certainly there are vast numbers that don't own a tablet. Uh, to give you a rough example, uh, Apple, which leads in the tablet market, has sold somewhere of around 160 million iPads since 2010. That's a remarkable achievement and for people that own Apple stock and you know I don't own any stock in any of these companies, uh, that makes them very happy. But uh, even 160 million iPads and then even if you add in the Android tablets, um, it's a it's a small fraction of the people that could own a tablet, especially as the prices uh, come down. So, um, you know, there has been a, a lot of talk about the difficulty of innovating in the smartphone space, but, and we have seen a couple of uh, iterations by Apple and Samsung that um, haven't been big giant jumps in innovation. This often happens, but uh, I think there's uh, even much more to do with, with, with the smartphone. And I'm, just to give you one example, um, the less you have to pull the phone out of your purse or your pocket, and the less you have to hit icons and buttons, no matter how ingeniously designed they are, uh, the more uh, convenient and kind of natural the process will seem. And so there's a lot of work going on in, in, in voice recognition, in what are called wearables. Uh, you know, Google Glass is a good example. Uh, uh, really smart things you wear on your wrist. I'm not talking about the, the fitness meters now that are out there, but significantly beyond that that would tie back into the cell phone sitting, the smartphone sitting in your pocket or purse and allow you to, to do a bunch of things. Uh, also giving, just staying on the smartphone for a minute, and it's, that's hardly the only area of technology, but um, giving it uh, more capabilities and more intelligence uh, in a way that's easier to use. So making a smartphone that is uh, aware to some extent, uh, not in a human sense, but aware of its uh, surroundings, aware of what's going on. So just today, for instance, Motorola, which is now owned by Google, is announcing a new smartphone that it says can uh, automatically adjust its functions uh, when it senses that it's in a moving car when it senses that it's in your pants pocket, you know, it'll shut down the screen and other functions to save battery because it senses it's turned down, screen down on a table or in your pocket. Uh, you can pull it out of your pocket and just by twisting your wrist, it'll immediately turn the camera on even before you've unlocked the phone or pressed any button of any kind or an icon done any swipe on the screen or anything. So those are, you know, examples of something that I think can get much bigger, which is phones, tablets, 
wearable devices uh, using their sensors, uh, accelerometers, gyroscopes, and then new kinds of sensors that maybe uh, can detect body heat or body function to do different things. And so we, we have a lot of stuff going on in technology now. Who's developing those sensors? I don't know the names of the companies. Uh, obviously, the customers for the sensors are, the, are, are many of them are well-known. Apple uh, buys a lot of sensors. If you have an iPhone, there are uh, a whole bunch of sensors in there. If you have a, uh, a Samsung <coughs> Galaxy phone, there are a whole bunch of sensors in there. And then there are uh, all these people making medical devices or fitness devices uh, that um, are using a, a new, uh, using various new types of sensors. Uh, so um, there's just a, a ton going on. At the same time, you are right. Some things are plateauing or even declining. The PC uh, I've been writing for years now. The PC has had peaked, and, I, and the proof has finally arrived in the last year or so, where you've seen. Uh, PC sales actually falling dramatically in the double digits, five quarters in a row. Uh, and uh, before that, it had been quite flat. Some of this had to do with the uh, economic uh, meltdown around the developed world and really the whole world uh, over the last four or five years. But even as economies have recovered, uh, the PC has peaked. When I say it's peaked, I don't mean it's done. I don't mean people are going to throw their PCs away. I don't mean that tablets and smartphones, for instance, can replace everything a, a laptop can do. But what's happening is that there are enough daily scenarios for which people used to grab their laptop that are more conveniently done now on a tablet, especially a tablet, but also a smartphone, that people find their, act, their actual daily use of their laptop has declined significantly. They still haul it out for things that a tablet and a smartphone don't do very well, like, for instance, creating a complicated spreadsheet or uh, writing along. You know, you're not going to write a novel probably on even an iPad with a keyboard. But um, uh, people are, are finding they use them less. And as they use them less, it means they feel like directing their money toward one of these other devices and not replacing the laptop as often. So that's what I mean by peaking. And I think that's what most of the experts mean by peaking. And uh, yeah, so some technologies plateau. Uh, right now, I think there's a somewhat of a plateau in smartphones, although I don't think it'll last very long. It's not a plateau in sales so much as it is in, in feature innovation. But I, as I just explained, with the kind of self-awareness thing, I think we're going to see a bunch of that. So I think that's going to keep going. And then other things uh, get replaced or decline or become less important in the life of somebody who depends on technology, and the, and the PC is an example of that. How's the BlackBerry Q10 doing? Uh, I don't know what the sales are of the BlackBerry Q10. For those who don't know, we should explain that um, uh, you know, BlackBerry, which I think most people know has been in a lot of trouble, missed a lot of the kind of revolution set off by the iPhone. Uh, very tied to corporate IT departments, which have themselves lost a lot of power and influence. BlackBerry uh, changed its leadership, changed its entire operating system platform, and brought out two new phones. One's called the, Q the Z10, and that is a all-touch phone, directly competitive with uh, the iPhone and the Android uh, phones, like the, the Samsungs and the HTCs. And that has not done very well. Um, the other one was called the Q10. Same software, same uh, functionality on the software, but it 
looks more like a regular uh, traditional BlackBerry with a physical keyboard. And uh, that's been out, uh, I want to say, two months or less. And I don't know the sales numbers on that. My guess is there, that will do pretty well, at least in the first sales quarter or two that it's out, because there is a pent up demand among people, uh, mostly BlackBerry users, who like physical keyboards. And this is a much more modern uh, software, it has a much more modern software base than the old BlackBerry, so they can keep using their physical keyboard and not feel uh, so behind the, the uh, Android and iPhone uh, uh, friends they may have. But I think the company's belief was that there was um, a finite number of those people, and that's why they had to bring out the other type of phone, which is more directly uh, similar to the iPhone and, and to the Android phones. So I don't know how the Q10 will do. I guess I'm guessing it'll do pretty well in the first quarter or two. Have you reviewed the Z10, and how does it compare? I've reviewed the Z10. A colleague, uh, my uh, uh, reviewing partner, Katie Barrett, uh, who works with me uh, here in our DC office, uh, reviewed the Q10. Um, I thought the Z10 was OK, and it had a couple of interesting features. Uh, but BlackBerry, uh, like Windows Phone, which is another platform where most of the phones are made by Nokia, uh, they're in uh, a difficult situation because they got started, at least in this new generation, the post-iPhone generation of smartphones, they got started late. And uh, it's been difficult for them to attract the apps uh, the variety and the and the certainly the important apps uh, uh, that uh, I think people are looking for. So they're really engaged in a battle for number three, and um, it's it's just a it's a tough situation. It's it's not that the phones are terrible or anything like that. They, you know, Windows Phone is really uh, got a quite nice user interface, and uh, it's been carefully thought through. The Nokia phones, hardware built around it has, for the most part, been pretty good. Uh, but they haven't been able to attract, you know, all of the, an app like, say, Instagram. And of course, this changes day by day, so what I'm telling you right now might have changed uh, by the time people see the show. But uh, last time I checked, they didn't have Instagram on there. I'm not sure. I don't think it's on the BlackBerry. It might be. But just that's just one example. Uh, and then new apps come out all the time. And when app developers, whether they're a small shop of five people or a big company with a app development team, uh, you know, these, these folks have limited resources. They have to prioritize what they do. And they're looking uh, for the platform where they can also monetize their app uh, as quickly as they can. And, and they continually go to um, uh, Apple and Android. And it's, it's a chore for uh, BlackBerry and for Microsoft to convince them to go with their platforms. Are apps for Apple and Android devices on par now? They're more on par uh, for uh, until maybe the last nine months to a year. I think uh, there were a large number of apps uh, where the very same app would just be much richer and nicer on iOS, which is the iPhone and iPad operating system, the Apple one, than they were on Android. I think that uh, there's a lot more parity. I still think of the, I guess, almost a million apps on both of those app stores, you're going to find uh, a greater number that are higher quality on the Apple side and a lesser number that are of the same quality on the Android side. 
you're also going to find a lot more malware uh, uh, viruses or other kinds of malicious software on the Android side. There's a reason for that that I can explain. But on the quality issue, I think the gap is closing. And, and certainly the numbers of apps, Android may even have more apps now than, than Apple. Um, why the malware on the uh, Android side? Well, uh, there's probably some technical under the hood issues that I, uh, I don't understand because I'm not an engineer, but I know that the one big issue is that the uh, Android App Store, which is called Google Play, is not curated. You can submit an app and Google never doesn't review it. Uh, so it's easier to slip th things in. Apple famously curates all the apps in their store and they, you know, they get criticized by some people who believe you shouldn't uh, make any choices in what you offer. Everything should be allowed. Apple just says, you know, we, we only reject, I think the number is 2% or 3% of the apps that are submitted to us. And I think that's true. Uh, but uh, one of their uh, criteria is that they test these things and they uh, and they uh, reject the ones they think carry malware. They're not perfect, but they've been pretty good. I don't think there is any significant malware on the iPhone. There is. There have been estimates I have seen that as many as 60% of the apps uh, on the in the Android store carry some amount of malware. Now, I'm not endorsing that number, but I've seen estimates like that. It doesn't mean those apps get downloaded a lot compared to the ones that are safe and popular. I mean, you know, there's, I presume there's no malware in the Facebook app. I presume there's no malware in the, in the, you know, Twitter app, in the, in the uh, Instagram app or whatever. Or the, or the various games that are frequently uh, downloaded on both platforms. Uh, so the, the, that even if that 60% number were true, it wouldn't mean that 60% of the actual downloaded and used apps have malware. But you know, it's, Google's aware of this. They understood the risks and they just preferred, and they will yank apps after the fact if they learn that they are in some way a problem but they don't curate beforehand, and Apple does. And some people are uh, drawn to Apple for what it does. Some people are drawn to Android. There are many reasons, but some people are drawn to Android for that reason, that they, that they don't like the idea of curating. Well, Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal, what do you use? Well, I, I'm not a good uh, uh, example because due to my job, I use everything. Right now, I'm sitting here with uh, a brand new Android phone that was just announced today, this one by Motorola called the Moto X, which is this. Looks like a normal phone. Yeah, it Can has it a number of interesting there. features. As I was saying, it it has a uh, the ability to sense uh, certain things about its location and movements. And then I also have this iPhone 5. So. Uh, you know, I'm always using uh, multiple devices. I own, I personally own uh, iPhone, a couple of iPads, a couple of Google Android tablets, and a uh, couple of Android phones. So, uh, you know, I try to use what I like the best and what works best for me. But as a practical matter, I'm, you know, I own know, three or four Windows computers and three or four Macs. I mean, you know, I have a Roku and an Apple TV and a Chromecast, which is the newest TV device. I have them all on my TV at home. Well, it, speaking of which, <clears throat> we asked some reporters who cover technology here in Washington if they had any questions for you. And uh, Yeah, you do that. That's annoying, but uh, <laughs> all right. One of the questions was about the Chromecast, and uh, this reporter says, you recently reviewed and recommended Google's new Chromecast product. How will Chromecast change television viewing habits? Well, we have to back up and explain what we're talking about because I don't think we can assume everyone knows what Chromecast is. So um, the tech industry in general, and 
uh, especially Apple and Google uh, and a few other, Microsoft and a few other companies have been trying to change television. They've changed phones, they've changed uh, you know, the music industry, they've changed lots of things, but uh, television has been a hard nut to crack, which frustrates these guys because they regard it as really pretty backward. I mean, if you think about it, if you carry around one of these devices and then you look at how these work and then how your TV works, try to go to the menu on your TV and change something, you know, it's, it's really quite primitive, even if the TV is new, even if it has a so-called smart TV uh, functionality. Uh, and so the technology guys have been trying to reinvent TV. The problem is that uh, there, there, there are two problems. The biggest problem is that you can build a TV, but what, you really, what they really want to do is change the content that's coming into the TV and equalize it. They want to equalize the internet content like Netflix or Hulu or iTunes content or Amazon content. They want to make that just another choice along with C-SPAN and NBC and you know uh, HBO and whatever else you're getting from your cable company. And the media companies are, are not crazy about that. And so there's been a lot of friction there. Uh, the second problem is if you build a TV and let's say you built a revolutionary TV that was much easier to use and took some of the lessons from these devices or even uh, you know, integrated with all your other devices, which is all perfectly possible. Uh, you've built a device in the TV that people really don't replace more than every, I forgot the number, but it's what, seven or eight years that people keep TVs and then replace them. It's not like these things, these phones, which a lot of people replace every couple of years. So uh, it's not as good a business in some respects these companies. So that's the backdrop. They're, they're trying to change TV. Um, the only way or the way they have so far been doing it has been by building a box that you plug into the TV. And there's Apple TV. They've sold about 13 million of those, which is makes it one of their very smallest products. It's a rounding error in their financial reports. But uh, they've sold about 13 million. And the interesting thing about that number is about half of those have been sold in the last year or so, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that they, it's accelerated. Uh, Roku, which is a competitor, sold about 5 million of a, of a similar box. And these boxes, what they do is bring content uh, that is uh, not coming from the cable company, because these are not cable boxes, internet content to your TV. So Netflix is a, is a great example. YouTube is a great example. iTunes, Amazon, whatever. Google tried that. They tried uh, something called Google TV, which uh, they did the software and a couple of other companies did the hardware and it was a failure. I, didn't, I gave it a, quite a bad review. It was kind of a mishmash and didn't work very easily. Chromecast is Google's second attempt. And what it is, is it says, you know what? We're not going to build a, a complicated box that goes on the TV. We're not going to put content streams uh, into that box. We're just going to make a little thing that looks like a USB flash drive. You plug it into a port called an HDMI port, which is a common, the common port on the back of HD TVs. And then you pl there's a wire that you use to plug it into power. and whether you have an Android phone or whether you have an iPhone or tablets of those two types, uh, you'll be able, you'll see a little icon pop up that will let you just beam whatever you would be watching on the phone or tablet onto the TV screen. Um, and that's the new product they came out with. It cost $35. Now, Apple for several years has had a similar thing. If you happen to own an Apple TV, in addition to the programming that's on the Apple TV that's built into it, like, I don't know, Major League Baseball, 
iTunes, photos, things like that. You've been able to use a technology of theirs called AirPlay, which does the same thing. There's a little icon on the screen. I'm watching a video or audio, you know, music. I hit that, wirelessly beams it to the TV. So Apple had that, AirPlay. Now Google has it with Chromecast. The pros and cons are kind of inverse to each other. The positive on Apple's AirPlay system is that it works with thousands of apps. And the app developer doesn't have to do anything. The little AirPlay icon just appears. It works on uh, just too many apps to even go into. You can sit down and just review all your photos on the TV screen with no wires, just hit that button. Uh, the downside on the Apple uh, uh, product and system is it only works with Apple products. So if you have an iPhone, an iPad, or a Mac, uh, it'll work. If you have a Windows computer, an Android phone, AirPlay doesn't work even if you own an Apple TV. On the Chromecast that just came out, it works across platforms. It doesn't only work with Google's Android operating system devices. It works with Apple's devices. And on a Windows computer or a Mac uh, with Google's browser, which is called Chrome, uh, it'll work with that. So if you have a Windows laptop and the Chrome browser and you want to go to the YouTube site, and you want to watch a YouTube video on your TV screen, it'll work. So uh, Google is cross-platform, Apple is Apple only. This is not an uncommon thing. Uh, and then the downside is that Chromecast so far only works with a handful of apps. On Android devices, it works with four apps, four out of a million. And then it works with, and they're, they're important apps for video, so it works with Netflix, YouTube, which Google owns, and then Google's own video and music apps. It's only really one app that Google doesn't own. Uh, on the iPhone, it works with Netflix and YouTube. Uh, and in my test, the reason I gave it a good review was it worked. I tried it on old, an old TV, and an old HD TV and a newer one. I tried it on Apple products and Android products and Windows laptops and you know, it just worked. Um, the challenge for Google is to get more companies to sign on and add that little uh, Chromecast icon to their apps. And the challenge for Apple might be to open it up to other companies' devices. And we're talking on the communicators with Walt Mossberg, personal technology columnist for the Wall Street Journal.